it's a shocking, shocking poison and it inflicts a fairly instant but very painful death. Rosalind McQueen is slumped over a kitchen stool but arched backwards with her back arched, which is something that happens with strychnine victims. They have terrible, terrible convulsions. The doctor refused to sign a death certificate saying that it was natural causes. I'm Andrew Rule. This is Life and Crimes. Today we're going to go back in time and look at the untimely death of a young wife and mother on the outskirts of Bendigo way back in 1986. Now this is not a classic cold case in the sense that the homicide squad has not got a file that it's pursuing, no one's making you know, television programs about it, it's not on anybody's top 10 or top 20. This is one of those deaths that falls between the cracks for reasons that we will explore today. The woman concerned was a girl from Swan Hill. Her name originally was Rosalind Joy Truman. Her name, surname Truman, rather like the American president. She was a happy-go-lucky local schoolgirl. She was popular enough. She was friendly. She was cheerful. She was well-liked, normal sort of person. She made great and good friends with a girl called Wendy. And in fact, Roslyn, the subject of this podcast, as a young woman became engaged to a close relative of her friend Wendy's, a guy called Graham. And she was engaged reasonably young, I think. And it was the 80s and she was, you know, a girl from a country town and she was, I think, looking forward to working in the local bank branch and getting married to Graham and settling down and and having kids and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, it turns out that the plans went a little bit astray because her fiancé, Graham, wasn't mad about getting married and settling down quickly enough for Rosalind's taste. And so she and her friend Wendy decided that they'd go and see the world and leave Swan Hill, and so they went as far as Bendigo where they moved to work in banks in Bendigo and they flattered together in the Bendigo suburb of Eagle Hawk, a fairly well-known place on the outskirts of Bendigo City. And there they lived fairly happily together, but there was one thing that they didn't share. Whereas Wendy would drive into work, Rosalind would take the bus. Now, she probably could have hitched a ride with her best mate, Wendy, but Because she'd started taking the bus, she became friendly with the bus driver. And the bus driver was a married guy in his 30s. And you've got to remember that Rosalind is in her early 20s. So this guy's maybe seven years older than her. And he's married with a couple of kids living locally. He's a former farmer from out in the Southern Mallee, a place called Brim or in the Brim Beulah area. Rosalind sits behind him on the bus every morning, as people do. They sit in the same seat and she cracks jokes and talks to him and all the rest of it. And she forms an attachment with this married man, Ray McQueen. One thing leads to another. McQueen's wife, Jeanette, mother of two children, a boy and a girl, becomes aware of this blossoming relationship and she is most unhappy. There is a suggestion that Mr McQueen didn't treat his first wife very well, but there's no detailed proof of that. But Mrs. McQueen certainly at one point visited the two girls in their flat in their apartment in Eagle Hawk and asked or begged Rosalind not to keep seeing her husband and flattering him with her attentions because, you know, she wanted to keep her marriage together and, and keep the family together, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, none of that worked and ultimately Mr McQueen, Ray McQueen as he's called, his real full name is Kevin Raymond McQueen, but known as Ray, he divorces his first wife, Jeanette, with whom he'd shared the family farm out in the Mallee before they moved to Bendigo. So they'd been together since they were quite young. And 
after the divorce, he marries in a very modest ceremony his new love of his life, Rosalind, Rosalind Truman. And so Rosalind Truman becomes Mrs. McQueen and our man McQueen leaves his bus driving job or maybe he was removed from the job for having a falling out with his employers and he moves on to become an insurance salesman with National Mutual, the big company, and he sells insurance to friends and family and anybody he can persuade to buy life insurance. They move out to Lockwood, which is outside Bendigo. It's a little tiny district out on the road to Maryborough. It's only a matter of 10 minutes drive from the suburbs of Bendigo, but it's the countryside. They're out in a reasonably busy road where they bought a house for not a lot of money, and they had a few close neighbours that they got to know fairly well, one of them being a nice old bachelor bloke called Vin McKenzie. Now, I happen to know Vin McKenzie a little bit myself. He was a friend of my late father's and he had originally come from Gippsland, from the Bruthen district, and he'd moved up to Bendigo for various reasons. And he was just a nice old fella, friendly, reliable, well-liked by everyone who knew him. And I think he'd sort of pelled up with the young couple next door And that was not to his advantage because when the events unfolded that did unfold, it was Vin McKenzie who found himself in the middle of them. What happened was this, that history sort of repeated itself in a way because Roslam had a little girl called Jodie and when Jodie was around two years old, Roslam became pregnant again with a male child. Now, she didn't give birth to this child. She was pregnant with this little boy and she discovered that he was a healthy, strong, unborn child. She'd listened to his heartbeat with her gynecologist. She had discovered the gender of the child and was really, really happy because she already had a little girl, so now she'd have a little boy and that would make her life complete. She was married with a little girl and going to have a little boy and everything was going pretty well except for a couple of things. Now, one of the things that hadn't gone that well is she'd had a little bit of a health scare. Now, it wasn't that serious. A GP had done a pap smear and told her that she did have some potentially cancerous cells on her cervix, but it wasn't that urgent or important or life-threatening and she'd be able to have the baby and then be treated and it would all be fine. Now, Following that diagnosis, she went off to see a specialist and the specialist examined her in March of 1986 when she's six months pregnant. And he said, the good news is this is not cancerous. This is a very small aberration. It's probably a virus and we'll worry about it after you've had the baby, but you're not going to get sick. You're certainly not going to die. It's all okay. Good news, good news, good news. And so On the Thursday before Easter of 1986, Rosalind McQueen receives this very good news, which she thought was good news. It's uncertain, really, what her then husband thought. Because at this time, it seems that perhaps history was repeating itself because the McQueens had started to employ casually a teenage babysitter called Donna. Now, we know Donna's surname, but not much point using it here. In any case, she now has a married name interstate. No point in uh, dragging her full name through this. She was only about 16, rising 17 at this time. She was a, a bit of a troubled kid. I think the married couple had known her a couple of years. She was from a family in nearby Kangaroo Flat. She didn't like school much, and they gave her a bit of casual work, babysitting, she became become quite friendly with Ray McQueen. Mr McQueen, country guy, former farmer from out in the Mallee. Like many people from that time and place, he played tennis pretty well because in the country in those days, a lot of people did. They grew up in the 50s and 60s knowing how to play tennis, and cricket, golf and footy because basically in the country, those were the things that people did. Tennis was very big in those areas. Every little tiny farming hamlet had a tennis court 
I think Lockwood had tennis courts, so they were certainly nearby. And Bray McQueen, now in his early 30s, is teaching the babysitter Donna how to play tennis. Now, this raised a few eyebrows around the neighbourhood because other people who played tennis at Lockwood noticed that Bray seemed to be paying too much attention to the teenage girl in their view, and this was a view expressed in subsequent court proceedings. So it's not just gossip. This is the subject of evidence led at a coronial inquest in due course. One person, Mrs. Wegard, gave evidence that she'd seen the couple, that is Mr. McQueen and the girl Donna, parking and engaged in some sort of amorous pursuit in a parked car near a tennis court. And it is a true thing that Roslyn, who's left at home with the toddler at this stage, starts to feel threatened by the presence of Donna the teenager. And in fact, she raises this with her best friend, Wendy, the other one from Swan Hill, and with other female friends that she knew. And I think with her mother-in-law, Mrs. McQueen. And so she's brought this up with these other women and they've by and large said, oh, look, don't worry about it. She's far too young. That wouldn't happen. She's only a teenager. He's just teaching her to play tennis. You know, he's 34 and she's 16. What could happen? Et cetera, et cetera. And reassured her, which was very nice of them in some ways. But it may not have totally reassured Rosalind. So we have a scenario where at Easter of 1986, the couple go for a weekend away, two or three days away, up to the Mallee where McQueen has come from. And in fact, they travelled up to Red Cliffs or a district near Red Cliffs near Mildura to visit an old school friend or old neighbour of Ray McQueen's. Ray McQueen's neighbour was a guy called Paul Bohm, and Paul Bohm had lived on a neighbouring farm. I think they'd been schoolboys together and played sport together and were good mates. And young Bohm at some stage had gone off and joined the army and apparently had come back to Mallee District post-army, presumably, and was employed up around Redcliffs. And it was there that the McQueens visited the Bohms. And this is interesting, at least interesting, according to the police and the coroner who later looked into the untimely death of Rosalind McQueen because the Bohms, also being farming people, had regularly baited animals, pest animals, because farmers in the Mallee, especially in times past when a lot of people used poisons fairly irresponsibly and in a fairly large-scale manner, they used poisons at different times. If there was a mouse plague, they would make poison baits to kill the mice which of course would kill a lot of other animals because anything that ate the poison mice would die. So it led to a lot of hawks and eagles and crows and other birds dying. They poisoned foxes at lambing time because foxes kill lambs. Some farmers in some districts poisoned killer dogs, wild dogs or killer dogs, rogue dogs, by laying baits for both foxes and wild dogs. And some farmers would use poison to poison the carcasses of dead sheep so that whatever birds landed to eat the carrion would die. They were obviously trying to kill crows and eagles, which is a terrible thing to do, but people used to do it. The point of all this is that farmers in that era, in the middle of last century, either used poisons or had used them in the past or were very aware that their fathers and grandfathers had used it on the farms. And many farmers in those days, such as the Bohms and the McQueens and others, did have a very, very potent poison called strychnine in a tin locked away in their sheds because strychnine was extremely potent, very, very dangerous. If you ingest even a tiny amount of it, it can kill you. It's so dangerous that if anything is poisoned by it, the poison kills several times when other animals eat the dead animal. You have to be enormously careful with using it, and anybody that grew up on a farm in that era, as I did, knows that it's a shocking, shocking poison, and it inflicts a fairly instant but very painful death. 
Interestingly, there was a story in the Bohm family shared with the McQueen family of the time when there was a bit of a catastrophe on the farm way back in the days when they lived at Beulah or Brim, where a tin of strychnine had been knocked down from a shelf in a shed and had spilt on the floor of the shed and it had killed the Bohm's pigs. That's how strong it was. It had killed all these pigs. Now, that would have been a subject of discussion that would come up periodically whenever those families got together. And it's open to speculation, as a coroner later speculated, that that would be talked about by those families on this trip to Redcliffs to visit the Bohms. And no one knows whether the McQueens acquired some strychnine on that trip, but it's never been proven that they did or whether they acquired some, you know, on an earlier trip, on an earlier occasion. But a coroner later speculated that that may well be the case because there is no doubt that strychnine made its way to the McQueen's house back at Lockwood. And we know this because on Easter Tuesday, the 1st of April, 1986, what notionally happened, the official version of what happened, according to Mr McQueen, is that he got up as usual to go to work on uh, the Tuesday after Easter and he left home at quarter to eight or eight o'clock or whatever after having breakfast with his wife and child and he picked up Donna the babysitter and drove her to her place of work before going to his office in at Bendigo. Now, Donna the babysitter would later testify that he was unusually quiet on this drive into town, which is interesting in itself. It was unusual for him to drive her all the way to her work. Usually he would drop her somewhere and she'd catch the bus or whatever. But on this occasion, he drove her all the way to work. The coroner later speculated whether that was some form of alibi. Uh, Maybe it was not. When Mr McQueen got to work, he said, oh, I've got to go and see the Twining family about the life insurance policy. I've sold them, but I've forgotten the documents with their date of birth. So Ray McQueen rings home because this is 80s, no mobile phones. He uses the landline at the office and he calls the home phone at his house and there's no answer. Now, his excuse for ringing is to get this detail off a document. In fact, he would later say that he needed the date of birth of the person whose life was going to be insured. As the coroner pointed out rather acidly later, there'd be no need to do that really because you were going to see that very person later that morning and all you had to do was spend another 30 seconds asking them their date of birth and fill it in. So he didn't really need to ring home to find out that detail. So if that were a fake excuse, it wasn't a terribly good one. There's no answer on the home phone. So he says, oh, uh, says Mr McQueen, I better ring the neighbour. And so he rings that nice old bloke, Vin McKenzie, the old fellow who lived next door. And he rings Vin, who's friendly and helpful. And he said, Vin, Roslyn's not answering the phone. You know, can you go over and see if she's all right? Vin obligingly goes over to the McQueen's house, knocks on the door, no answer, goes in, and there he sees a terrible thing. Rosalind McQueen is slumped over a kitchen stool but arched backwards with her back arched, which is something that happens with strychnine victims. They have terrible, terrible convulsions, terrible fits, and they die with their back arched very unnaturally and she was arched over this chair onto the floor with I think her head on the floor. Running around in the kitchen I think fairly upset was the little girl Jodie who's only two and a half not yet three and all she can say to Vin McKenzie is something like mummy's dead and daddy went to work. Mummy's dead and daddy went to work or words to that effect. It's an interesting scene, is it not? The panicked and worried and distressed Vin McKenzie rings police ambulance. He rings the husband back. He breaks the news. Something awful's happened. 
McQueen drives back from Bendigo to home in a hurry and he comes in and the police arrive, the ambulance arrive. Now, his demeanour and his conversation is interesting. He says, oh, she's had cancer. She's got cancer. She had cancer. And there might have even been some talk of a possible heart attack, but there's much talk of this cancer diagnosis, which, of course, the previous Thursday had been dismissed, but he's talking about it anyway. Interestingly, before this, Mr McQueen had discussed with a fellow National Mutual insurance person the possibility of raising the life cover on his wife. Now, she was insured for something like $17,000, which in 1986 was a, a handy amount. It was enough to buy a small, cheap house, you know, in the country or a paddock or something like that. You could do a good renovation with that sort of money. It was probably six months' salary on a good salary. So it was a significant amount of money without being life-altering. But he had said to this colleague, oh, I'd like to put Rosalind's life insurance up to 60000 which was a lot of money then, like two years' salary. But he said, I can't do that because, you know, she's already had this cancer scare, so I guess I won't be able to get uh, any more life insurance for her. Now, that was an intriguing piece of information to pass on to a colleague because it planted the seed of, A, I'm not raising her life insurance, so therefore, you know, nothing sinister about that, and also planted the seed that she had an ongoing health issue with cancer, which would probably be convenient if and when she later died. That was speculation raised by the coroner at a subsequent inquest and raised by investigating police. That's not my idea, that's their idea. So here we have dead woman, two-year-old child, apparently grieving husband. He's not grieving too much, though, because... Within two or three days, the neighbours notice that he and his relatives are outside burning the clothes and property of the deceased woman. And within a matter of days, he makes a suggestion to Donna, the teenage babysitter with whom he is engaged in some sort of love affair, that she move in with him. Now, she didn't actually take up residence in the house. It may be that she was fairly spooked by the idea that Rosalind had died there, but she did not move into the house as the live-in lover. She did, however, still continue an association with him for a short time. But when McQueen, within a matter of weeks, made a proposal to marry her, she rejected it. She decided that she was young and he was old that, you know, his wife had just died. It was all very heavy and unpleasant and scary and she didn't love him that much and so she walked away from that relationship which left Ray McQueen looking for another life partner. The one that he eventually found was a lady called Carmen and Carmen was another Mally girl but her parents and she had moved to Bendigo, as many people do from the Mallee, and she lived in one of the close-in suburbs like Golden Square or Kangaroo Flat. And he knew Carmen and he hooked up with Carmen afterwards and eventually he married Carmen and they, in fact, remain married to this day. But that's another story. What happened in the meantime is that when a doctor was called to the scene of Rosalind's death, the doctor refused to sign a death certificate saying that it was natural causes. And this, of course, sets in train certain procedures. The coroner then has to take over the dead body and have it examined, toxicology reports, post-mortem and the whole thing. Now, the body is examined by a pathologist and so on. The samples are sent away for testing at laboratories. Meanwhile, the McQueen family and the grieving Truman family have a funeral and Rosalind's remains are buried in a local cemetery at Kangaroo Flat, Golden Square area. 
And for a short while, there is a sort of an uneasy peace. But then comes the toxicology report, and the toxicology report shows that Roslyn had died of a massive dose of strychnine, five times the lethal dose. Now, that would be calculated to kill you rather quickly. A small dose will kill you in several hours and a large dose will kill you in several minutes. And it would appear that it was the latter, a large dose that had killed her quickly. The police were soon involved and the homicide squad was called in. And the homicide detectives involved in this case were fairly confident that this was either a murder or a manslaughter. It was some form of homicide. They did not think they were wasting their time. They believed that a likely scenario was that Roslyn had been given something like a, a iron supplement uh, capsule with her breakfast because she was pregnant she was taking these supplement capsules and that perhaps she had taken one full of strychnine with her breakfast that morning. They further speculated, as did the prosecutor and the coroner, that Perhaps she'd had that capsule before Mr McQueen actually left for work and that she'd been dying or even dead before he left. They further speculated in the subsequent coroner's inquest that he would be worried naturally about his little daughter being there by herself with her dead or dying mother and that would be one reason why he was preoccupied and quiet during the trip into Bendigo and another reason for him to ring around rapidly and get an excuse to ring Vin McKenzie, the neighbour, to go in to discover the body and to look after the little girl. That would all make sense. These things were speculated, as I say, by the prosecutor, the police, and by the coroner. And we'll be back after this. Now, in fairly rapid order, as soon as the toxicology report comes out with the finding that it is strychnine that has killed Roslyn. Her husband is arrested and charged with her death. He's held in custody and an inquest is called, which happens at Eagle Hawk under the coroner, Jeff Hoare. Jeff Hoare is assisted in his work by two homicide detectives, Detective Sergeant Ron Blackshaw and another detective called Michael Furlong. The prosecutor was an experienced person called Nigel Parkinson, who's no longer with us. Uh, he's passed away. Ray McQueen's interests are represented by Defence Counsel Joseph Toll. Now, what we're going to do here for the edification of listeners is to sort of parse and pricey the coroner's findings, because we don't want to be saying anything about what did or didn't happen when we can go to the experts who had the benefit of scientific evidence and all the other forms of evidence that were produced in the coroner's court at Eagle Hawk that year. Mr Hoare, in summing up and making a finding, said, I'm invited by Mr Toll, that's a defence lawyer, to return a finding of suicide or to at least not exclude it as a possibility. In the end, uh, Mr Hoare did exclude it. The coroner did exclude suicide. He said it was clear that Rosalind Joy McQueen had died by a lethal dose of strychnine taken by her in her own home or surreptitiously administered sometime between late on the Monday evening and breakfast time on Tuesday, April the 21st. It was interesting that he raised those two possibilities, that she'd either taken it herself with the idea of suicide or a cry for help, as sometimes happen when people do something not wanting to kill themselves merely to attract attention to their plight or their unhappiness. The alternative to that scenario, which he didn't really favour, was that it was a surreptitious administration of the drug in order to achieve her death. Now, Mr Hoare, the coroner, went through the theoretical possibilities. He said, one, could it be accidental? 
Well, his finding was that was quite unacceptable. He said the strychnine could not have found its way to their house accidentally. It had to be introduced to the house in the fairly recent past, and then it had to be introduced into Rosalind's system. So he didn't think it was an accident. Two, that an unknown person had administered the strychnine. The coroner said that that was impossible. He said, despite an implication that poor old Vin McKenzie, the neighbour, had somehow brought the poison onto the property or brought it into the kitchen or done something, that that wasn't true and that any implication to that effect was very unfair to Mr McKenzie, who was actually just a friendly, nice, gentle man and a bit of a white knight. The third theoretical possibility is that it was self-administered, that was suicide. The coroner, he rules that out for various reasons that we'll look at in a minute. The fourth possibility is that it's a cry for help. He says, that's too far-fetched. The coroner said, that's not a real thing. He doesn't believe that at all. And the fifth and final possibility is that it was an unlawful and malicious act by Ray McQueen. In other words, either murder or manslaughter by her husband, who in the coroner's estimation had the means and to some extent the motive because of his infatuation with the teenage babysitter. Also the fact that his wife's life was insured for a considerable sum and this could matter in this situation because he'd already been through a divorce that had cost him anything that he'd owned and in fact the farming property that the family had back in the Mallee, I believe, had been sold to settle his first divorce. And so he was a man in a position where in order to separate himself from his wife, he couldn't really afford a second divorce. This was the implication made by the coroner and by the prosecutor and by the police. And so the coroner boils this down to a case of suicide or homicide. In looking at this, he points out that suicide is not that likely because, as we know, five days before her death, she'd been told good news by her gynaecologist. She didn't have any cancerous cells. It wasn't a problem. It would all be okay. This was good news. It's interesting says the coroner, that Rosalind got the good news about the cancer not being cancer just before they went on their road trip up to the Mallee to visit the old family friends who may well have still had supplies of strychnine. The coroner, on balance, rejects the suicide scenario, although it's conceivable that someone might use strychnine to kill themselves, and some people have done that in the past. He didn't find it a feasible theory. He didn't think that Rosalind was sufficiently depressed or anxious or upset that she would take such a drastic step. He believed that she loved her two-and-a-half-year-old daughter too much to you know, kill herself at all, let alone kill herself while no one else was there to look after the child. He also said she'd just received all the good news about her baby boy. She wanted a baby boy. She'd been told that there was a baby boy on the way. He was a healthy, unborn child. She'd heard his heart beating. She was looking forward to his birth. And apart from the problem of the babysitter and her husband hanging around with the babysitter, a lot of other things were looking pretty good. So the coroner concluded that it was unlikely that Rosalind had committed suicide and that it was far more likely that she'd been the victim of foul play. The coroner pointed out that were it suicide, would she do it in the presence only of her little daughter that she loved? Would she not organise it a bit better than that? Would she not leave a note explaining her angst and her fears and all the rest of it, her anger? Uh, there was no sign of any of this. There was evidence led at the inquest Interestingly, from 
her mother-in-law, Mrs McQueen Senior, who's now dead, Mrs McQueen Senior, loyal mother, said that her daughter-in-law, this is her second daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law Mark II, you could say, was somewhat anxious and depressed and that this was a scenario that pointed towards a suicide scenario. But the coroner didn't think that that held water. There was also evidence given by a couple of female friends of Rosalind's who said she had expressed concerns about the babysitter Donna and they'd assured her that it would all be okay. So bottom line is the coroner's not thinking at suicide. This is what the coroner said. In part, how does a mother, pregnant and with a two-year-old child, go about getting strychnine over the Easter period, assuming she was not already the possessor? The same proposition might, of course, be argued in the husband's favour, but the prosecutor, Mr Parkinson, has met that argument substantially and has certainly shown where the likelihood lies of whom might have been the possessor. Now, that means that the prosecutor is pointing the finger at Ray McQueen, saying if anybody could get strychnine and bring it home to the house, it would be him, the farmer boy who grew up with it, not the girl from Swan Hill from the town who would have no knowledge of it. Coroner, again, he writes this, Why choose such a painful death if it was suicide? It plainly had to be planned. Why not choose a gentler and more certain method and one far less painful? For example, hanging or carbon monoxide poisoning in her car or even a self-inflicted gunshot wound if there were a gun in the house. And I assume there was because of the husband's sport. He'd been a farmer and a shooter. There was no prior history of suicidal tendency, which is a factor very often present in suicides. There was no suicide note, again a factor. If she wanted to suicide, why the tidying up of all the evidence? Unrelated, but furthermore, there was to be a family reunion the following week and she was to see her favourite aunt and had told her stepfather she was looking forward to that. Even her own husband has conceded in statements that she would not commit suicide. I agree with him. No poisons were found at the house so that if she suicided, She either ingested all she had obtained or buried or washed away the remainder. It quite surprised me to find from expert evidence that the lethal dose of strychnine was as little as 200 milligrams or about the content of one aspirin. How many lay people disposed to take their own life by strychnine poisoning would know this? The coroner further writes this, I say that the possibility is very real that Rosalind was already dead or dying when McQueen left for work that morning. If she only became ill after he left for work, assuming suicide is excluded, surely she would have telephoned her husband or a doctor or a neighbour. I have excluded accidental ingestion. I have excluded the possibility of poisoning by an outsider. I exclude as a possibility the proposition that Rosalind McQueen took her own life. This leaves me with one reasoned and reasonable hypothesis, that she was poisoned in some way with malicious intent by her husband. I do not rule out the possibility that one of the iron capsules was filled by him with strychnine powder and left for or given to his wife. Capacity and motive become relevant. Did Raymond McQueen have the capacity, disposition and a motive to kill his wife? He has demonstrated that he had a capacity for cruelty in that he visited physical violence upon his first wife. I accept her evidence in that regard after things went sour in the marriage. He falsely accused his first wife of attempted suicide when she herself was pregnant and I accept her evidence in that regard. The evidence of many witnesses establishes that he became infatuated with Donna during the year period to his wife's death, and particularly since the start of the tennis season in about October, November of 1985. Now, this infatuation is evident from the fact that he was prepared to invite and did invite this young girl of 17 to live with him as man and wife within weeks of the death of his wife, after expressing his love for her within days. 
Mr McQueen had had experience with a variety of poisons, plainly had knowledge of the lethal qualities of strychnine, and his father used it at Warrignambeel when he, McQueen, was a youth. The view is open that he resigned himself to the possibility of Rosalind dying sooner or later with cancer. He goes on to say that McQueen may well have resigned himself to his wife dying of cancer and cheered himself up with the prospect of having the young Donna to step into the shoes of his wife. He says he agrees with many of the matters pointed out by the prosecutor, Mr Parkinson. He says that when Ray McQueen promptly declared that his wife had died of cancer to the police, it doesn't look good for him. It looks as if he's trying to create an excuse. He also says that when he told police and others that the marriage was happy and content, that that wasn't really totally honest. He says that McQueen's reflection of the future went awry because he learned on the Thursday before his wife's death that Roslyn was not going to die of cancer after all. I am of the view, writes the coroner, that together with a desire not to go through the family divorce court, this event was the catalyst for his decision that his wife should die. And he means by that that the discovery that she would not die of cancer meant that the husband would find some other way to ensure that she died. The coroner writes this, it is of some moment that he would benefit financially to the tune of $15,000 to $17,000 by the untimely death of his wife. I conclude that he carried the decision that his wife should die into effect in some way either late on Monday night or more probably in the two hours prior to his leaving for work on Tuesday. And here's the formal finding. My formal finding is that Rosalind Joy McQueen died at Lockwood on the first day of April 1986 from strychnine poisoning unlawfully and maliciously administered by Kevin Raymond McQueen. And I further say that the said Kevin Raymond McQueen did thereby murder the said Rosalind Joy McQueen. Now, that is how the coroner's finding ended up in the months following the death of Rosalind McQueen. What subsequently happened is that the coroner directly presented the murder case to trial. Now, this meant that it didn't go to committal. Most serious cases are usually referred to a committal proceedings where a judge or magistrate can weigh up the evidence to see if there's a likelihood of it achieving a conviction in front of a jury. The coroner bypassed that as was a coroner's right in that era and it was presented directly to trial. So what happened in the great poisoning case of Rosalind McQueen, the lady who took a massive dose of strychnine in 1986? Well, despite the prosecution and the coroner and the police and the neighbours and her own family and friends, despite all of them thinking it was a clear-cut homicide as opposed to suicide or accident, when it actually got to the stage of going before the Supreme Court in a trial at Bendigo in 1988, two years after Rosalind's death, there was a bombshell when the Director of Public Prosecutions scrapped the entire trial. Everybody else was in shock, but the Director of Public Prosecutions, John Caldry, explained their reasons for not going ahead with it. In explaining why the case would not go ahead, a spokesman for the Director of Public Prosecutions said the director, John Caldry, had found there was insufficient evidence to guarantee a conviction against McQueen. Mr Caldry said this nola prosequi did not mean that McQueen had been acquitted of the charge but that the prosecutors had found there was no prospect of convicting McQueen on the evidence before him. The director decided it would not proceed because, in his opinion, and that was after receiving advice from the prosecutor and exercising his own judgment as a skilled counsel, there was insufficient evidence to secure a conviction, a spokesman said. 
and we'll be back after this to finish our story. And that is the end of the story of the poisoning of a wife and mother in rural Victoria many years ago. Of course, there is no suggestion from the makers of this podcast or from the Herald Sun or from anyone else that this is not a just result. If there is not enough evidence to proceed, there's not enough evidence to proceed. It's interesting that it is not regarded as an acquittal. It really is a statement that at this point we don't have the evidence to go ahead. The Herald Sun is not suggesting in any way that Mr McQueen is guilty and it is clear that for decades, since 1986, Mr McQueen has vehemently protested his innocence and has never made any admissions. Unless or until someone comes forward with some very compelling evidence at this very late date, this case, officially at least, will remain a mystery. Thanks for listening. Life and Crimes is a Sunday Herald Sun production for True Crime Australia. Our producer is John Burton. If you like the show, leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to know more about these stories, links are in the description of this episode.